So uh, this talk is actually starts with my first React job. And one day my boss comes in and he says, um, I want you to do so on, you know, this bunch of requirements. But one of the requirements was to make a fetch request that was cancelable. Um, as we all know, fetch requests return promises which are not cancelable. Um, and, then, and then he goes, oh, also I want debouncing. So, you know, to, to not make too many re requests. And also I want retries. And I want to show recent history. And also don't re-render the app if everything's the same. So, so all these requirements start trickling in, right? If you're a professional developer, you're pretty used to this, not all coming in at once. Um, in, and then I do some research, and I, I find that in RxJS, um, there's all these functions that, that let you do this in one line of code. So that's debounce, that's retry, that's window, that's distinct until change. So RxJS gives you, it's like Lodash for um, asynchronous programming. It gives you all these functions that are just built in by default. Um, if you were to do this in normal JavaScript, you'd have to have a lot of state and have a lot of lines of code that, that are potentially buggy. Um, so, and then I was like, all right, RxJS is, sounds cool. It's a lot. And, and then I go research about it, and I was like, all right, what is, what is this reactive programming, and, and what is it good for? And Quora, the top answer, goes, it's especially good at user interfaces. That's funny, because I'm a professional user interface developer, and I don't use uh, RxJS or functional reactive programming. Um, so then I start looking into functional reactive programming, and I discover this alternative to RxJS, and then I discover hot and cold observables, and then I discover all the libraries that, that are based off of RxJS, and then I discover that the creator of RxJS um, doesn't agree with anyone who implements RxJS for a living, and he says they're all wrong. So nobody agrees, right? This is yak shaving. Um, and I was going down that rabbit hole. I'm not gonna talk about what reactive programming is today, um, but you know, if you want, these are all the resources and the slides are on the, on the link that uh, I started with. But um, something that was always bothering me at the back of my mind, like, aren't I doing React? Like, like React should be reactive. Um, and that's, that was the, the question that started off about six months of research. Um, so just a little, back, little bit of background about myself. I started out in finance, right? And I, and I worked with spreadsheets. Um, everyone knows spreadsheets. They've been around since the dawn of computing. This is VisiCalc, 1979 to 1983. Um, let's just go through history. Lotus 123, uh, it just died in 2014. Um, this is OG Excel, uh, which I spent a lot of <laughs> my time on. Um, oh, I mean, this is, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a previous slide that I cut out for time. Um, but basically, spreadsheets are the prototypical, there are more spreadsheet programmers than all of us, like, the, like these like, traditional reactive uh, imperative programmers. When you type in, in an up, a cell value, it updates with you know, the entire sheet, right? So I'm typing in foo, I'm typing in bar, I'm changing foo, and it changes the answer for foo times bar over here. Um, so that's a reactive thing. It's, it's, uh, what, what's so great about spreadsheets? It's a minimum viable app. It's got a database, it's got a UI, it's got only business logic, it's 100% declarative, and it's always consistent. You're, always, you're never gonna have inconsistencies fall out. Um, it's so simple, and it's, in short, it's reactive. Um, in fact, it's such a selling point that the first version of Angular, when it came out in 2010, was actually marketed, that's, that's 1.2 for the people at the back, you can't read it, but it says it's marketed as because it's like a spreadsheet, that's why you want to use Angular. Uh, and that was what made it so different from uh, prior, um, I guess, attempts. Um, JavaScript, on the other hand, is not reactive. So if I, if I declare two variables and I, change, and, I, and I have a summary calculation of one of them, and I change the, the, the dependent variable, the answer doesn't change. Um, so, but we also have reactive APIs. So the, most, the one that you're gonna be most familiar with is add event listener, right? Like when you, when you, when you, have, when you, when you uh, listen to a click, you give it a handler and it can call multiple times and, it's, and the parent is in charge of, uh, and, and the button, for example, that you, that, you register, that you listen for a click on is gonna call the handler multiple times and that's a reactive thing. Like something happens and, and your code reacts to it. Um, you can also, so, so there's a design pattern that, uh, is, that, that gives you a lot more power over, reactive, uh, over your reactive functions, and that's called observables. It's really simple because you can implement a basic observable in four lines of code, right up there, um, and you can use it to say hello world just like this. Um, we're not gonna go too much into detail, but basically, that's all you need to know. Obser observers ob subscribe to observables, and if you wanna have a really clear, I guess, um, mental model, listeners subscribe to podcasts, just like observers subscribe to observables. 
right? Um, and there's a, there's a slight nuance of hot versus cold, which we're not going to go into. So you can turn any uh, reactive API, like a callback for an event listener, into an observable by wrapping it with a function, for example, like from event from RxJS, or you can code it yourself. Um, all, all that to say is everything that you see on the DOM is reactive to something. You're clicking, you're scrolling, you're typing keyboard, you're, you're, you're loading uh, stuff from, from HTTP. Um, you're even interacting with reactive APIs like Firebase and MongoDB. So um, everything can be a stream. Everything, and this is the meme version of that. Uh, you, can, you can fit uh, tons of events um, in, in your reactive program. Um, seriously, talk, if you talk to a reactive programmer, they, they, it's a religion to them. Like they, they were like, all right, everything's better if you just put it in an observable. Um, and, and, and then if you think about like, our mental model of React, like it's, very, it's very common to think about React as a function, view as a function of data, right? Um, but the problem is there's a leak extraction here because data, data isn't static. Like this is a static page. Um, if you're going to statically render HTML, that's good. But then what happens when data changes and your view has to change? Um, you have to like, do differential calculus or something on this. Um, um, so so uh, about two years ago, people started referring to React as more of a view stream that's a function of data streams. Like data streaming in, and the, the, the views are, are a function of that data. But what's the problem here? And that's what I'm uh, going to answer. Um, and, and really, what I, what I did was um, I looked into it so much that I was just asking this really dumb question. I was like, what if React was reactive? And, that's, and, and to be clear, React, the React team um, believes, in this so, believes it's not reactive so much they put it on the docs. And uh, this is something that people don't really understand or know. Anyway, so, so I made my own React. I, called it, I, I call it Reactive React. Um, and I'm really glad that Jeff's talk was before mine because uh, it, it's kind of like the, the lead up to it. Um, I took all of that JSX and I put in a reactive core inside of it. So here's the core of it. Um, you have to import uh, a virtual DOM library and an observable library, just because uh, it's not part of JavaScript yet. There is a TC39 proposal. Then you have to define your own mount uh, function. So you're, just, you're constructing a stream from your element, and you're, and you're mounting it. And then you create, you're, you're rendering all that mounting. And then you're, and then you're appending a child using the, the regular DOM API. And then the, 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 the real core of the thing is a scan operation, which is like an array.reduce in your JavaScript, where you translate um, you know, existing state, you take a new event, and then you, you take new event times existing state equals the new state. And then you just do that on repeat until your page ends. Right? So that's not a lot of lines of code, and that's the core of Reactive React. Uh, you can, you can take it the full, look at the full repo. It's about 200 lines of code. Um, so, so it's like, all right, is, this wasn't that hard to do. Um, like I'm not, I'm definitely not as smart as like the React team. Like why didn't they not do it? Like the, this this component API is is amazing. Like look at this, look at this. Uh, th here's a here's a counter. Um, I don't, I'm not working on my laptop right now, or, or I do some live coding. But um, here's here's a basic counter. You can do clicks by registering click handler. Um, if you're familiar with Reason React, um, uh, that's this is the is a very similar API. Uh, and if you're f familiar with Redux, um, your state changes are just described by reducers all the way. Um, so that's a very familiar component API. Um, and, and, here, and it really corresponds to the mental model that we have of React, which is you have an initial view. You click something, it updates the view. You click something, it updates the view, right? So what's, like, what's, what, what's the improvement here? So you can, you can start treating time as a first-class citizen in your code. Um, you don't have to start doing set interval and then like, just like, put in states and stuff like that. Um, you, you just declare a source, a source stream, just like any other stream, just like the, the click stream that we have. I, have a, I now have a time stream, and I, and I can feed that in to uh, my CSS, for example, and now I have a blink tag, which uh, is being brought back from the 1990s. <laughs> uh, I also have this fun example called Crappy Bird, um, which is merging data streams and time streams together. So over here, I have a click handler, right, which, which increments things by two. And then I have, over here, I have a time handler, which decrements things by one every second. So that, that's, that's Flappy Bird, right? You, things go down every second, and then you, you click, and they think things go up. So that's, flappy, that's Crappy Bird. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, if we were doing live coding. But, but basically, look, two different streams and one view, right? You can merge them all together, uh, and, and they look really nice. Um, I, again, I'm not on my laptop, so I can't show you uh, the live code, but it exists. Um, so what's missing? Like I, we're still like in, in the in the territory of like React should be reactive. Like everything works. Like I can I can I'm a scrub. I can do this. Like 
what's going on. Um, so here's the deal. Um, when, I was a, when I was a hedge fund analyst, like, I made giant spreadsheets, right? These are all live data updating and formulas like ref cross-referencing all over each other, right? Um, and this is fantastic. This is easy for me as someone who like, was just starting out coding. But th uh, this, this screen locked up. Like, it was not uncommon for this screen to crash. And, and the whole reason was that there were too many updates going on at once. Um, so the problems with Reactive React, the, my sort of straw man version of, of what Reactive a reactive version of React would be, is this poor interoperability. That's like a familiarity cost that we pay because the rest of JavaScript is not reactive, so like they can't do much about that. But let's just pretend everyone knows reactive programming. What then is still our problem, right? And that is the core of what we're going into. And that's this part on the right, which is the wasteful, janky rendering. And that's what we're really going into. So the first problem is too many updates. So um, if let's say there's, there's multiple updates, so we, the human eye can only see 60 and 90 frames per second, and that translates to 16 millisecond frame windows. And, that's, and, and our computers actually operate much faster than that. So if too many updates are calculated and come in, come in and are calculated, you actually have wasted frames that you're never going to see. That's not very good for your phones, or it's just not very efficient. For example, another, another uh, yeah, well, 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 we'll get there. Um, so too expensive, too many updates, or you can have too few as well. You have, too, you have very expensive updates. So JavaScript is still th single threaded, even though reactive programming allows you to think in streams and merging and combining streams. We code as if they're concurrent, but they're actually not concurrent. Your, your computer is actually doing the, the work in the background to jump back and forth between them. And that causes a lot of drag, especially with uh, expensive updates like that. Uh, there's a benchmark here that um, you can click through to see more if you want to learn more about that. Um, so our mental model of rendering is not complete. So there's an update right, that comes in, and then we try to render it. And that's the computational cost. And then we, and then we see the view. Update, render, view. Right? That's different from our simplistic model where update just goes straight to view. Right? There's, this, there's a render cost that goes in there. So this is fine until it's too expensive. Like, what if the render takes a long while? You're going to have a drop frame. And imagine this is just one frame, but you could take, I don't know, seven seconds to render this. Right? Like, um, then your screen locks up. That's, that's what your mental model should be of thinking about rendering. Um, just to lighten the mood a little bit, this is what you want. Like, people passing along things really nicely. Uh, and this is uh, what you got with your rendering, where uh, it's a whole car crash. It's, this is, yeah. These are very expensive cars. Um, so the, uh, and, then, and then the other problem is um, inputs, double streams. Right? Remember we, when we looked at those double streams? Inputs are not created equal. There are low priority updates, which maybe take a long while to render. And then there are high priority updates, which maybe take no time to render. Um, the low priority updates block the high priority updates. So, so for example, if you're typing in an input, uh, here's, an, here's another place where I would do, like, do some um, live demos for you. If you're typing in, another, on, in live input, um, you want to see that update faster than the rest of your app, right? Um, and so, uh, and so the, the, the low priority update blocking the high priority update is not an ideal solution just because you have a sort of direct straight through processing model of uh, rendering. So you really look deep into it, and then you realize, and then, and then I realize that there's two different paradigms of data flow. One is push, and that's what we've been discovering so far in this talk, which is it's data-driven, it's reactive, it's real-time, and data by default is in motion. You will take data from me whenever I have new data. And that's analogous to subscriptions like podcasts, um, as well as events, which we're going to come to. But then there's also a pull data flow, which is demand-driven, which is lazy, asynchronous. Uh, data is at rest until you call for it. Right? Uh, and it's, it's analogous to things that you check, like your watch, your to-do list, GitHub PR, and site, and your sense of sight. And that's very important. Your sense of sight is pull-based. You're pulling data from the outside world. Um, so uh, and there's a very direct analogy to programming models with single and multiple pulls. So if you want to do a single pull of data, you call a function. If you want to do multiple pulls of data, you call an iterator, dot next, dot next, dot next. If you want to do asynchronous, you do a promise for single, for single calls. And if you want to do multiple uh, push, if you want to be pushed data multiple times, you have an observable and you subscribe to it. So that's the pull versus push paradigm. And the realization here for me was, hey, maybe we shouldn't push everything. Look at all these problems. Like they're all, I blew up the red arrows. The red arrows represent push paradigms. Um, and maybe we don't, want, we don't want so many red arrows. So how do we break that gap? We introduce a middle layer, and that's a queue, right? Um, we push whatever we want into the queue, 
and then only when we want to see it, we pull from it. That is, this is so freaking simple, right? But you've never thought about React this way. You've never thought about there being an intermediate queue between what, you, what events are happening and where, what you see and what you render. This is, this, is, this is the state of React as it is today. This is, this is how we batch updates. This is why set state is asynchronous, um, and uh, so on and so forth. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of other uh, nuances. Um, so really, the, the mental model we should have is Vue as a generator function of data streams, and every time we request an idle callback, we say dot next on whatever, like, like, like what you got, right, on, on the next, uh, on, on the stream. Um, there's more info on MDN, which is amazing, by the way. Like, um, it's, it's all documented there, and we're just introducing it to React now. And but wait, there's more. Like, why stop there? Because if you have our mental model of rendering, there are all these other problems that haven't been solved. We just solved batching, but that's, that's just the base layer. What if we have a priority queue where our low priority inputs um, don't block the high priority inputs, and, they, and because it's high priority, it gets processed first because it, it came in, even though it came in after the low priority queue, right? So that's a, that's a priority queue algorithm, which you, which you might study for an interview, um, but this is applied in real life. Um, so, so it's, so, and then what happens if um, we can't finish uh, rendering um, halfway? So instead of cutting, so, so this, this, this line, right? In order to render the, the view, we, um, we actually have to stop doing any work here uh, for the processor to cut over to actually committing stuff to the DOM. So in reality, what we want to do is chop up, we, we partially evaluate our, our React tree all the way down to wherever we run out of time, stop, render what we have, and then continue again, right? So this is, this is the sort of broken up, time sliced model of async React that is coming down the pike for React 17. Um, and then we go, all right, uh, and then, so, so that's time slicing. And the last bit that we want to talk about is um, side effects and React suspense. So currently what we have is, um, this is React, right? This, this core bit of queuing, rendering, and committing to the DOM is all React. Um, pushing is, is your component API that you, that you write. That's your app. Um, and then you have, you have this red bit, which is side effects. Um, I, have, I have a missing word here. Um, but basically, this is, when you, when you have an update, let's say when you click a button and you, you pull data, Right? You send two updates, one to your queue to render like a loading page, and then the other to your, your uh, state management, so that state, ma state management can, can then call another update when it's loaded the data, and that's Redux, right? Or MobX, or whatever state management thing you're, you have. The whole problem with why we have so many state management libraries is because we're managing this outside of our library, of our, of our React renderer. What if we pulled it in to our, um, to our I guess, rendering function, um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and call it uh, what it is. This is React, right? We're, we're slowly building up to a conception of what React does for you as a middle layer between you and the browser. Um, so it's, you, you have an update, it, it bundles together um, the, the data dependency, it goes and gets the data, the data dependency while, while it renders, um, and once it renders, it updates itself without any state management library. Um, so, what we've been building up to, this, this, this middle orange red bit, um, is called the scheduler. Uh, it's a super, super overlooked uh, part of React. Um, everyone looks at the reconciler, everyone looks at virtual DOM, but actually it's a scheduler that enables you to have performant uh, rendering. People call it the UI virtual machine in the past. I think that's too ambitious. I call it the React runtime system. And it's very much operating system theory um, which I know nothing about, but when I started reading about it, they use all the exact same terms that we do. Um, because what you're essentially doing is you have a lot of events coming in and you have limited resources and you need to figure out how to, how to schedule those resources. So React is not a dumb rendering layer. It bridges the reactive, reactive component API, but it stays performant as though it was a, it was a pull function. So it, it's, merging, it's mixing that push and pull paradigm and it manages the priority of queue of work in, in, in future versions of React. So more analogies, even though observables are like podcasts, right? Um, you use podcasters, you, you don't listen to things straight away when they come out. You actually have a list, a buffer of like, of, of like accumulating stuff. You have email apps for email newsletters. You have DVR and Netflix for television, right? And issue trackers. Okay, imagine if um, uh, in GitHub, instead of push pull requests, everyone, everyone was pushing requests to you and it immediately got merged in. It's a terrible way to manage open source, right? Um, so push and pull is everywhere in your life and, and that's, what, that's how they're managing uh, the rendering sequence in React. 
Um, and that's about it. Um, hopefully that was a clear explanation of why React is not reactive. Um, and you, hopefully you appreciate um, what they've done. What they, they chose all this four years ago and are only now realizing all the benefits of the async uh, react rendering that they're, that they're doing. So I really would ap appreciate your feedback and thank you for your time. Okay, so, so the question is, um, um, Angular uses RxJS as part of their framework. Um, why, is, why is it not as good a fit? And is that because of, RX, uh, of React having a virtual DOM? Um, so the, the, the thing is, the, the, this, this model of push-pull reactive programming um, is in every single library. Um, it's, some, it's something that we don't even know about because they, they just do it for us. And the people who write these libraries don't even talk about it. Like, I have to find this out myself, writing my own shit. Um, and um, this is so cool, right? Like, uh, that, that, that this, this stuff is going on in the background and we don't even know. Um, so I would say that, the, no, um, so you can layer, um, so let's, let's talk about this. So you can layer uh, RxJS on front of your library as, as your interaction with all the events that are coming in. But at the core rendering layer, if you don't want your, your app to choke up, you're going to have to have a pull implementation. Um, um, and that's what Angular will have in, in their core as well. I don't know for a fact, but um, I've talked with enough people. And I know, I know for example, Vue and Elm have it. Thank you.